Okay, let's start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is Gen Dispatch. We're starting on time. Uh, please be seated. And uh, those close to the door, uh, please close the door. No. Ecker, can you close the door? No. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, I'll give the microphone to uh, Shuping next to me. So this is Gen Dispatch in Prague. I'm Martin, and this is Shuping. Okay, thank you, Martin. Hello, everybody. So we start our session. Okay, so first, this is the note well. I'm sure you are familiar with it. And uh, again, please follow the rules. And uh, when the discussions uh, become hot, please be friendly, politely. Thank you. And here is the meeting tapes, and it's in the middle of the week. I'm sure you are familiar with this. And uh, just uh, uh, when you come to the Mac, please also use the onset tool so, so we could uh, record. We could uh, have the order. And when you are not speaking, please mute. And here are some resources. So you could refer to, and uh, this is our agenda for today. And we got three items and here we need to have a change. So please note, we are going to move the third one to the first. So the order is changed. Sorry. Can we just move the move it to the second one? I think we just need to get clear of two o'clock for for Eric's benefit. So um, just moving it up one will be fine. I'd like to start with the easy one. Okay. Okay. Yes. To. Okay. So anybody has any questions on the agenda? If no, we are ready to start. So welcome to our first uh, speaker, please. You want to drive the slides? What do you want? So I'm here to talk about expiration. Um, <sighs> Thanks, Lars. The pedants in the audience have noted it's about best before, not expiration. I don't care. Um, so um, when I was preparing these slides, I, I, I looked at the draft, and I, I don't often see the, 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 head, the, the page top and tail. And I realized that the... The abbreviated title of this draft was um, uh, Drafts Are Not Milk, and I thought this was an appropriate image to put here. I didn't realize that I'd done that. Sorry. And next slide, please. <clears throat> oh, let's, let's move on again. So um, I wanted to give you a bit of an example of the sort of pattern that I see in in documents, and this is this is a document that I wrote a number of years ago, um, and you will see from the sort of chart here that's taken from the data tracker, there is a very specific cadence of updates, and it might just be that those those uh, lines between one, two, three, four, and five were exactly on six-month intervals, and then the update rate sort of slowed down. And it turns out that I was updating the document because I was just updating the document. I was just feeding the machine. And uh, if you look at the diffs between some of these versions, there are changes in some of them. Uh, and some of them are very, very minor. Ultimately, that document was published. 
because the information in it was considered useful by the community. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, expiration. Uh, if a draft has expired, it's not irrelevant or stale. Um, we find that RFCs often cite internet drafts. Um, relevance might be correlated with age, but uh, documents can go bad in less than a day. I've had that happen. Uh, but also they can stay fresh for many, many years. And I routinely cite internet drafts that have never been published uh, in various conversations. It doesn't have anything to do with the abandonment state on a document. It's not necessarily the case that the authors have given up on it. Uh, sometimes working groups are just not ready for some piece of work. Uh, sometimes uh, the group needs to pause to spend time and attention elsewhere. And more than anything else, it's not really an accurate, an accurate reflection of anything. It's a prediction, uh, a very crude one, about uh, the status of the document uh, 184 days from the time that is published. We're not precogs. Next slide, please. So the, the proposal is to sort of just remove it, and trim a little bit of boilerplate out of the documents. Um, it doesn't match practice. Uh, we keep these documents. Uh, and also uh, to realize one of the major pieces of feedback that I received on the first iteration of this document was that um, the expiration date sort of helps us focus attention and, and say, well, an expired draft is not one that we'll be talking about. Um, I don't find that chairs have any trouble understanding what is and what isn't relevant for discussion in working group sessions. And so uh, I think that this really only encourages pointless busy work. Next slide, please. So, um, shouldn't be necessary, but um, reminders about uh, documents being uh, needing replacement or updates uh, is something that people have identified as being useful as part of our process, but uh, we have other ways of being able to provide for those sorts of capabilities. The draft suggests something. I'm not particularly wedded to it. The idea that if you had a document updated before the previous session, and it hasn't been updated just in advance of the current session, you might send someone a, a reminder. So rather than getting this sort of, this drip of your documents expiring, you would get uh, an email a couple of weeks ahead of the ITF meeting saying, the following documents were updated before the last ITF meeting. Maybe you'd consider updating them for the next one that's coming up. Next, please. All right, so this is the second go of this. Uh, I asked, I think, pre-pandemic. Uh, the draft expired. Uh, it was still current for the entire time. I think I've changed a little bit this time. Uh, there's that text about what we might use uh, for reminders. And uh, Paul Hoffman has volunteered to help out as a co-author. Uh, also believes in making this very small change. So that's all I have. Robert's on the queue and wow, many people are typing. Robert Sparks. I am amenable to the notion of removing the concept of expiry, but I don't see value in putting the effort into doing so without putting a lot more effort into what might be a better substitute for some of the things that you were shooting down the straw men. Um, there is a aspect that expiry is giving us at the moment that steers perhaps imperfectly newcomers and episodic participants in the process away from looking at things that are going to waste their time to look at and without it the amount of things that will waste their time is very very large so um i will say that very simply, yes, and, and we need the and. So um, are there particular things that you would 
would have us do things like data tracker changes? Is that is that sort of thing we're talking about? What what drafts get put um, under people's noses? Community behavior changes, right? Okay. So not just the, the data tracker needs to enable what the community needs to change in its behavior, but the community needs to be able to say, okay, I'm not, I don't think anybody should bother with this draft anymore. And there needs to be incentive to give people uh, a reason to say that, right? Um, that we need to have more cleanup efforts. And the expiry thing is, I think you captured in the draft, it, it, is, it was originally there under the idea that somebody could have a bad idea and it would automatically be quietly forgotten, right? Um, but we don't get to quietly forget anything anymore. Stuff's around there and it needs to be explicitly marked as the, no, nope. so. So Robert, you said this and, please send text because there's no reason just because this document is called expiry that it has to stop there. <laughs> yeah, but people should know they are in the queue or not. John. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to several of the problems that this, this draft and the comments identify. Uh, yeah, I think since this is a dispatch group, I think this is clearly worth further discussion. Uh, I agree with Robert's comments about the and. Uh, I note that the presentation focused entirely on IDs, which are associated with IETF working groups, and that's not the whole population. Uh, but when we start talking about the chairs, no, and the working groups, no, and sometimes things aren't ready to deal with that. We're talking about a subset of documents, not all of them. Again, subject to further discussion. And, uh, and I think we're pushing the line here in, in many ways uh, about the reasons why the internet drafts were uh, identified and created originally, uh, which is to have working documents which are being worked on uh, rather than documents which are treated as permanent. Uh, and that's certain we've got the rules about RFCs referencing IDs correct, uh, but I'm not certain that the fact that they do that uh, is, uh, as an excuse for throwing away expiration dates. Uh, thank you. So just quickly, John, um, we said chairs. We know that there are chairs of every stream that makes drafts. This was not just about the IETF. Well, but there are not chairs in terms of expiration dates and, uh, um, and what have you for the independent stream. Uh, there may or may not be chairs for the RFC stream. Um, and, uh, and there remain individual and independent submissions. Fine. Send text, John. Um, I'm, I'm happy to send text, but I'm questioning some of the premises. So and, uh, and when you say send text, you are more or less assuming that the community is going to go with this, and I'm not there yet. We are not assuming that. We still would like text, even if the community doesn't go with it immediately. Uh, Ted Hardy, Phylum Cordata. I would like to say I like the basic idea. Thank you very much for putting the time into it. Uh, I think from the dispatch point of view, uh, it probably does need a mini working group to help catch all of the little bits and pieces that we need um, I especially like the idea that we might go from here to more explicit signals about whether this is ongoing work or not. Um, it's always been possible for the, the chairs of a working group to ask for uh, tombstone documents to be produced. Uh, speaking as a chair who does not get niggled to do that, I have almost never actually asked a document author to produce one. Uh, and we could actually take this uh, forward into much better signals than this which as has been pointed out, uh, has ceased to be an effective signal since we no longer actually delete the drafts when they're expired. So thanks again for the work and mini working group is my dispatch answer. All right. uh, on, on that point of better tools, I think to tombstones are often more work than people um, are willing to invest at that time. We do have the ability to mark drafts as dead 
in the data tracker. And I think that's a tool that we can use a lot more effectively in, in this context. I think the working group could dis discuss that fruitfully. Thank you. Exactly, yes. Mark? Uh, yeah, Mark Nottingham. I agree with Ted, uh, many working groups appropriate. Um, I think this is worth pursuing. I, I, I'm, I hear Robert, and I think there is a related issue here that, that the status and especially the relationship of, of drafts to our documents and to the IETF is not clear. And that's something we've talked about before. Um, one could see this as potentially contributing to that, but I don't think it's a major uh, contribution. I think uh, uh, it's a much bigger problem that we also definitely need to talk about. And there are a lot of different ways to address that, but, but I don't see this as contributing. And actually in, in a way it helps because the alternative to having a repository like the internet drafts repository is to have proposals and, and related documents spread all over GitHub and other places and people not really being sure uh, uh, what their status is. Uh, uh, and, and that is the experience in some other organizations. I actually think the ID repository, having it all in one place is a really good thing. And this improves that because you have more history. Sure, but once it's in the archive, you don't have the, you know, the data tracker becomes effectively frozen. No, no. I, I think working through the details of these issues and how the tools address them in a mini working group would really help. Yep, high order bit, yes. Lars? Lars Eggert, not, not speaking as AD, but as an individual. So historically, right, there was very limited things the data tracker and other pieces of the uh, tooling we had could do. And so, you know, this is sort of a kludge that was used way back when, and it, it overlays a whole bunch of different things in, into this one little tag. Um, for example, um, at the time, right, RFCs and internet drafts were a lot more uh, frequently referenced by academic works, and there should be a signal that, you know, this thing isn't something you should put into your SICOM paper, for example, right? And also that's, that's where this, you know, must not be referred to as anything other than work in progress bit comes from, right? I think sort of that has sailed. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm personally open to sort of exploring what might we do that actually um, is more useful than, than trying to overlay all these meanings on this, you know, one little concept here. Um, but, but keep in mind and that there's different considerations that apply to this little thing. And I, I think the, personally, the, the limited working group thing, if it goes that way, could be a way to make sure that everybody who has opinions about what this means for them, has a way of saying something about the potential new thing. David. Hi, David Skenazi, busy work enthusiast. Um, yes, please do this. So for two reasons. The first one, speaking as a document author, um, there are, like Martin said, some of them that like just having to turn this crank I mean, at this point, I'm close to sending a PR to Martin script to just auto-publish every six months to avoid this, and that's just silly. Um, and uh, more importantly, speaking as a working group chair, uh, having drafts expire has caused like serious confusion a few times for us in the past. Uh, we had an author who, for personal reasons, couldn't be working on drafts for a little while, which happens, that's okay. The drafts expired, they didn't resubmit it, and then we had this whole confusion ensuing with the AD about the status of the document and all that. That was all caused by the tooling getting in our way instead of helping us do our job. So please remove this antiquated notion to help us do our best work. Rich. Rich Saul is too short. Uh, yeah, this is, this is I, I understand the history about it and why it was useful then. It's not really useful in particular. Uh, if a document expires while it's in the IESG hands, it's particularly galling because then it quietly disappears from everyone's agenda. Um, no. Well, it disappears from the working group agenda and the shepherds don't know to nudge people. Um, and it, the traffic of, yeah, refresh, nothing changed. Um, perhaps we need, you know, we need to, do need some minor tooling work, like maybe abandoned is a better word than dead in some cases. Uh, but. I don't know if it needs a working group or AD sponsored has a design team, but yeah, I support doing something in this area. John. John Peterson. Yeah, just chan channeling Lars a bit. I mean, I view this as kind of an anachronism that has been left over from a bygone era. 
right? And I think what may be a focus for a mini Excuse working group. Me. Are you referring to me as an anachronism? You from are a personally era. Paul Hoffman in an anachronism. Um, I, I think personally, an interesting scope for a mini, work, a mini working group might be what amount of metadata needs to be embedded into these documents versus what needs to live in the tracker, right? Now that we have a tracker and all these tools, as Lars was describing, like is Robert, and I think this speaks to your point as well, right? Like, is there part of this, because these do go disseminate out into the world and, you know, we let people republish things in various contexts. And I think we're talking about derivative works even later and the things related to that. So like, I, I think the question is really what actually has to be in the document that's gonna instruct people that it's status versus what can be metadata in the tracker itself. Valuable discussion, I am positive we need a working group to do that. Andrew. Hi, Andrew Kempling. Um, I wonder if it'd just be simpler to simply uh, extend rather than six months, make it, I don't know, two years or something, um, because if something hasn't been changed in, in that sort of period, it probably does need to be marked expired, uh, in my view. But if, it, if this is to go forward, I think it, it does need to have a working group so that there's discussion from all the interested parties. Thanks. Colin. Sorry, I was so slow. Um, Colin Jennings, I, I think that I, I want to speak to the mini working group versus AD sponsored. Um, I do not think this should be AD sponsored because it'll be impossible for it, it'll be such a frustrating thing to be dealing with all the comments and calling consensus on that no AD is going to really want. They, they prefer, I, I think there'd be a large preference to have the structure we get from a working group for calling consensus on this. Um, that you don't, that's much more difficult when you're doing something as AD sponsored. So even though the text seems simple enough for that, I think the consensus process would really push me towards um, A, I think we should do this, uh, and B, I think we should do it in a mini working group. Uh, I will note on the point of times, uh, Cisco had a draft about how caller ID worked for a large portion of the network for 10 years, which it never had intention of doing as an RFC, and it just refreshed the same draft for roughly 10 years. Um, we've also been in situations where, uh, which by the way is still to this day more used than any of the ITF RFCs that replace it. Um, the, uh, so you have drafts like that that are floating around and you also have situations, I've been in many working groups where on the working group agenda we're discussing an expired draft and it causes confusion for people about what the rules are around that and all of those things. So again, I just 100% I agree that this is just something that from a long time ago that we don't need anymore. Eric. Yeah, um, I mean, to, to echo your hearing from other people, um, this is like a, a relic of a bygone age. Um, um, you know, the internet runs at internet drafts and um, the internet never forgets. And so like the conceit that these things somehow expire in, in a world where like they don't expire, it's just like a complete map territory confusion. Um, I, I frankly got up to say um, that we should just publish this as AD sponsored um, rather than having a, a working group. But Colin persuaded me that we need a mini working group. Um, but I want to explain my reasoning um, for uh, uh, why I was concerned about that, which is that this is a very simple thing and we should just do it. And to have it dragged out behind some like endless series of like, we have to do X, Y, and Z before we can do this is like a totally any pattern. And so if this working group is chartered, it should be chartered with its first work item to publish this document with effectively, you know, the minimal changes needed to get online and not whatever metadata data tracker process changes need to be made. Um, not, um, and then it can be rechartered perfectly well to handle other things. But what should not be the case is this should get scope creeped out to take five years because people um, are worried about the side effects. Not all technical not all solutions have technical problems. Anthony. Afternoon, uh, Anthony Liquid. Um, I concur, mini working group, and uh, just echoing Cullen's thoughts as well. Um, quick suggestion, perhaps, maybe expired is not the right word. Maybe something like stale, um, you know, like moldy bread. Um, so, and better signaling in the tracker that, you know, these documents are old. Let's, you know, check for something newer first. But yes, I think increase the expiry at the very least. Otherwise, yes, get rid. I'm happy with getting rid of it too. Uh, Colin Perkins, um, a process point. Um, the ETF 
and then the IETF working group can make decisions for the IETF stream. We have internet drafts in other streams, right? You can't have a working group which makes decisions for the other streams. So, um, Colin, I believe that all the documents talk about, all the internet drafts say there's working documents of the IETF. Uh, that is a problem, yes. Um, but, I'm, but not, we, I'm not we, attempting to solve that problem as well. Maybe we but, can talk about that later. But, but we, we need, if you want to make this decision, you need to consult with the other streams. This oh, absolutely. Not just the no question. IETF can decide unilaterally for all the other streams. No question. Yeah, Lars, like, this is another economist, right? That in, in, while the internet drafts are individual, they're all submissions to the ITF. And then when they get adopted by, say, a research group, they, they change state. And we, we could make it such that if there's an indication at submission time of an individual draft of whether the target is, they already counted towards that stream and therefore this, that, those, that stream rules apply. Um, but that is something that's bigger than, I guess, this document is proposal, but it, exactly we, right. should, we should think it through. And, and hence, maybe a working group is better than any sponsored. Um, I, I'm, as the AD until March, I mean, this is not gonna finish in March, but um, my successor will have a similarly busy schedule. I do not want to run the consensus process here for this thing. Uh, I want chairs to do it for me and then pay attention as needed. Thank you, Roy. Okay. You want to say a few words? Oh. No, no, you no Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the feeling we get on the room is that there is support and there is uh, additionally to that support for uh, progressing that work as a working group. So we'll uh, follow up on the list and make the recommendation to our AD. Yeah. So um, I'd like to talk about flatware as my next topic. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this document is, uh, I'll bring it to the ITF um, because I want to talk to the trust about um, the licensing of RFCs and potentially internet drafts as well. I don't, I don't know if that's uh, quite as relevant, but uh, the draft talks about RFCs. Next slide, please. Right, uh, let's go over the whys. Okay, so um, the document talks about, is a request to the trust to have them uh, relicense RFCs such that people can take those RFCs outside of the ITF specifically and make derivative works based on those RFCs. So first point, uh, I believe this is the right thing to do. Uh, other SDOs uh, have this ability. Uh, I'm just listing the ones that uh, my organization is involved in, uh, but um, these, are, these are options in ECMA. Uh, it's the default in W3C, uh, I think, there are other smaller groups that do the same sort of thing. Uh, key uh, argument in the draft is that ongoing maintenance of a protocol does not have to depend on, in, in this case, the IETF, uh, to be continuing to have the expertise and the willingness to, to do the work. Uh, someone else can take up that mantle uh, without having to ask us for permission, uh, which I think is a good thing. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we talk a bit about open standards and what open standards mean. And I think there's some very interesting definitions of what this means. Uh, I don't think openness in this particular way has been discussed too much in the standards area. Uh, but I tend to think of open standards much in the same way as I think of open source and working on open source projects. Um, and when I look at it that way, our licenses are more restrictive than theirs, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the sort of fundamental questions that often comes up when contributing to open source projects is, um, what does it mean for me to give up my contributions? What, what is it to mean that I'm giving up change control over the thing that I've developed? And um, one of the kind of the, the stickiest things with contributing to, contributing to the ITF is that um, you have to give up change control and there's almost a guarantee that you won't get it back again. Um, whereas open source projects have addressed this particular tension and this concern by saying, well, the license on our work 
is is open and if you don't agree with the direction that the project is going uh, you are distressed by the lack of ownership and maintenance on the project you can just pick up take a copy of the code and, and join all your friends and, and go and do the work elsewhere and so the projects give people the right to, to fork the project um, as a way of managing the, the risk that people might decide not to contribute or join in the work. Can I, ask, can I ask a clarification question? So I often talk about the similarities between open source and open standards as well. And in my mind, one of the differences, and maybe you can help me navigate this, is that for open standards, um, if open source, if it forks, right, the, the, the market or whoever will, deployment will figure out a winner. Um, and, and interoperability doesn't mean quite as much or it's not quite as necessary as for the internet where we had this issue with MPLS and TMPLS, which was the ITU2, ITU, ITU flavor oh years ago, where there was really like the danger of in like pronounced incompatibility yep. at the network layer. I have slides, Lars. Little patience, please. I'm getting there. Next, please. So um, one, of the, one of the things I realized in, in putting this together was that uh, by allowing derivative works, we, we actually regain a little bit more control over how it is that people um, use the work. We can specify conditions on the use of those derivative works. Uh, the thing is, our copyright only protects the text of the RFC from copying. It doesn't protect the, the protocol from copying. We've seen a number of cases where people have tried to build uh, in TMPLS, in, in, for instance, they didn't need to copy the text of the RFC in order to produce something that was non-interoperable with MPLS. And so um, that, that realization um, is, is one that I think underlies a, a number of the recent uh, sort of concerns that we've had about people taking works and, and creating things that were confusingly similar to the things we had or um, non-interoperable or camping on the same code points or those sorts of things. So by allowing derivative works and saying, look, you can have the text, we can also place conditions on uh, what those those copies do and regain some amount of control. We can we can talk about naming, we can talk about code points and other things. And the draft has some proposals along those lines. Next, please. So there are some risks. Well, I've identified one. Next slide. So let's just say one of the possible outcomes here is that a risk, uh, the, the fork is successful. And I think my response to that is fantastic. I don't think we need to be worried about that. Uh, it happens often, um, it happens relatively rarely in the open source world, but there's a lot of examples of it because there's a great number of projects. Um, and often uh, this is the result of neglect on the part of the original owners or diversification of needs or any number of things. It doesn't necessarily need to be an interoperability risk. Uh, it depends on you know, the conditions that I was talking about. Next. Uh, forks do create the possibility of market confusion. If uh, we have uh, two versions of MPLS that are called MPLS and people don't quite know which one it is that they're getting, the ITF version or the uh, um, cheap generic brand version, uh, that could be potentially quite bad. Uh, we've seen that with um, the, the work in Etsy regarding TLS. Um, Forks that do this for open source tend not to be successful and people are smarter than that. And so I'm not particularly concerned about this one, but uh, putting some safeguards in place um, is, um, is, is a good thing. First of all, I think the, most, the, the best defense against this sort of thing is having the ITF be the best place to do this sort of work. We, we do excellent work here. The value of our contributions is derived from the uh, agreement that we reach and the consensus of this community and the, and the people that participate here. I don't think that's... Uh, that's in question. Uh, but there are a couple of technical constraints that we can place in, uh, in the document that conditions on the use of uh, the, the work, acknowledgements of the original, different names, and whatever other things that we can think of. And again, this is the opportunity to, to use the ability to create der derivative works to, to control their use. Next. So I've heard license, uh, points that the trust can just license in special cases. Um, I've considered asking the trust one by one to license every single RFC uh, for this purpose. I won't do that, but uh, uh, mostly the, the problem here is that it just comes down to knowing the, the right people. 
uh, and not everyone knows how to do that, um, and really doesn't address the open participation concerns that underlie any of this. Um, and the final one is uh, we need people to stop being wrong on the internet. I advise people to remind people of the XKCD comic on that one. Good luck. Next. And uh, let the queues begin. John. Yeah, I, I have considerable sympathy for you, for the desire to be able to move stuff from one SDO to another, but but the way your draft is written, I mean, it would be a disaster. I mean, it means that like, hi, I'm from the ITU. We're going to come up with this new thing called TLS 1.4, which is a different name that has exceptional access that we will only use for, for terrorists and and child pornography, and and it's going to be a totally open spec available for the nominal price of 150 Canadian 150 Swiss francs per copy, you know, and they could do that. Um, <laughs> They can already. Um, Etsy did. Well, but not using our documents, you know. And I think, you know, and you know, and <laughs> saying you can't use the same name, you know, gets you into the miserable trademark world of confusing similarity, where lawyers make an enormous amount of money. So I would, I would be entirely sympathetic to a draft that says the I, <clears throat> the IESG can request the trust to, you know, to to, to, to give some organization to give some organization the authority to, to make to make derivatives. And the reason it's a request is, is in some cases, we don't have the right, the in, in, for most RFCs, we have the right to make derivatives, but for some, we don't, you know, and if we can't, we can't. But I am, you know, yeah, I, I, I realize people can do bad stuff, but I, I think that as, as presented, this, you know, this is, Way too much of a kick be sign on our back, and I would I would rather sit, and since this isn't it doesn't seem likely to happen all that often, I think just telling the ISG that this is an option to give someone else give it give it to someone else would be a reasonable reasonable way to go ahead. Rich. Oh, great, hello, John. Hello, the mic. Um, yeah, so. When this first came up months ago, maybe, I was like actually fairly strongly opposed to it. I think it's actually now a good thing. Um, I think there's definitely issues about keeping, protecting our brand, I hate that word, and our intellectual property and our contributions and making sure it doesn't get diluted by bad forks. I think hand-waving and saying, like, look, in open source, they're, they're smarter than that. Those are open source developers. It's not the CSO in some office somewhere who all he sees is, TLS, I mean, we had a big discussion in TLS about what we name 1.3, right? Because the version number was important. And if someone says, oh, well, this is, you know, enterprise secure sockets, 99, it's obviously better than TLS 1.3. Um, the trust job is definitely to protect our stuff and make sure it's always available. And I think we've tended to conflate that with, and nobody else can reuse it. And so I've, I'm in favor of loosening that grip. I think there's a lot of knotty issues to solve. Um, and uh, yeah, probably needs a working group. Also, one point you mentioned about you can turn over change control, uh, not ever being able to get it back has been a, an issue for some. Ted? Uh, Ted Hardy, uh, my apologies to the author. I did not read that till this morning and I sent you a uh, mail on it this morning. Uh, which I absolutely assume you did not read, but is now in the Gen Dispatch archives for, for anybody else who wants to come look at it. Uh, the short thing here is I believe that this is, a, you've identified an appropriate problem to solve, uh, that a working group is the right-sized effort uh, to solve it, and that I think what you currently have is sufficiently unworkable that if it was being dispatched uh, to a, uh, an, an area director for, for publication that it would have to be, um, uh, I, I would have to say it should not be dispatched at all, would dispatch to null. Um, and I, th I think that among the things that I identified in there were that the way this is written now, none of the pre-existing RFCs uh, would inherit these new license terms. Um, and if that's, you, you look quizzical, if that's not your intent. That, go, that was not my intent, no. Uh, you should go reread section five then, because section five, as it's written now, appears to say that. Um, and 
uh, perhaps that's a bug I should have called out as here's a key error to fix that. Um, I believe it would be quite difficult for us uh, to retain some of the other rights uh, which are associated with documents if we made a change of this level retroactive. And I'm particularly concerned here about licenses for IPR, which are written uh, to specify that they apply to um, usages relevant to a particular standard. Um, I think those do not travel with the forks by nature. And you would have to figure out whether you also needed to ask new questions in the IPR pieces in order to achieve that. I also believe that there are cases where we very much would be willing to say, I am willing to surrender change control to this organization, but not that one. And a mechanism that would allow you to limit who takes up the derivative work right uh, seems to me necessary for those cases. So I think this is going to need some thought. I think a working group is about the right size to, to manage that, and I'm willing to contribute to such a working group should it be uh, sure. Thank you. Galen. Yeah, just one couple of coming up. Section 5 was intended to rep, uh, apply to those documents that were published prior to the trust getting the, license, the, the proper license that we have today. So 5378. Uh, anything prior to 5378, I, 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 I left out because I was unsure about the status of those things. Uh, thank you for that clarification. You may want to check the word. I, I, yes, I think I, I, I just checked it and it, it, it is not good. <laughs> Hi there, Glenn Dean. Um, morning, Colin. I may be here a while. Uh, so I, I'm the chair of the ITF Trust currently. Um, many people have held that job before me. Many people hold it after me. Uh, so I'm going to, my first set of comments are as chair of the trust, and then I'll make some comments with that hat taken off. So as chair of the trust, thank you for listening to us. Bringing it to the ITF is exactly the right place to have this conversation because the trustees cannot make a decision on stuff like this. We follow the guidance of the ITF. Uh, so continue with the trust hat on. There are some, the, as written today, the, the way you structured the document, I could not turn that into a license agreement as stated. There's things that, that can't be done uh, with the controls we have legally in the way you want to, you've approached it. So if, if we were to go forward with this, it will need uh, some radical changes made to it. Okay. Um, so hat off, IP licensing nerd hat on. Uh, so one thing I see you're doing is you're conflating code implementations, which open source, forking, all that kind of good stuff, and um, the protocol specifications and the protocols within them. So let me sort of peel back what I mean by that. Open source software has on it a copyright. And that implementation, that code base, you can license. And you can, through various open source licenses, grant the ability to fork it and you can specify things you can and can't do with it in those license terms because you're granted a license for the code. Within an RFC, the document, we hold a copyright on that document. There's really two copyrights that, actually two licenses that apply to a, a document. One's the copyright in the overall document itself. If there's any code snipp snippets inside the document, we have a separate license. And if you go look at the uh, ITF Trust TLP, it, it gives that breakout, but code, code is separately licensed. And actually there could be a third one, which is examples, which can be, uh, they're, they're more free and, and they're specified. That all said though, the copyright does not prohibit anybody from implementing, and we did this by design, right? The protocol within the document, you can take the parameters, they're up in IANA, those are not copyrighted. We, we put a statement, uh, I'm, I'm blurring hats here. There, the ITF Trust put out a statement a while back, uh, along with IANA saying the stuff in the protocol registry is not subject to copyright. You can just take it and use it. And so you can take it and use it today to the implementations. That's true already. Uh, as well as the, um, the, the protocols and stuff inside the documents, you can take them and, and implement them and do whatever. You can make your own versions of them because the copyright applies to the document, not to the protocol. Does that make sense? It, which is different than, than an embodiment of code where the copyright applies to the code and you sort of get the protocol along with it. And so the, the controls you're trying to do here to enable things, 
doesn't quite fit. Now, that said, if you were to, or if the group ultimately said, look, like I think Ted suggested, if the intention is to allow for other groups to take our work and be adopted, let's say TLS, we decide we're never going to do TLS again, that would be something that, like, as was suggested, maybe the ISG could suggest to the trust, hey, you guys go off and license it to this group over here. We reviewed it and we've given them the thumbs up. We've done a community review and all that. That's a pathway here, but I would recommend against not doing a blanket thing as a sort of generic boilerplate. Uh, and then the other comment, uh, and this gets really into the weeds here, is the name. Um, so in your draft, you call specifically out, hey, maybe we're gonna license it, but you can't use the name. Today, the ITF does not trademark any of the names of any of, any of the protocols that the ITF has. It never has, it currently still does not, which means that there is no protection mechanism today from you deciding that you wanna make quick and I wanna make quick and Barry over there wants, wants to make quick. We can all make quick, we don't need anybody's permission. And so I get where you're trying to go there, but it's, it, it, that's more like, again, going back to a software type license where you'd want to fork a, 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 you know, an implementation. So I'm happy to help you know, give some guidance. I'm not a copyright lawyer, I'm not an IP lawyer. I just, I'm a nerd that practices in that space. So those are my comments. I have, I have consulted with uh, someone who was a lawyer on this one. Um, and the distinction between the protocol itself and the text of the document, I think, I think is, is clear in the draft. If it's not, then I think it's just a, a drafting error on my part, it's a zero, zero. Um, we definitely need to get that um, fixed up if, if that's a problem, thank you. So, Colin James, I, I think this is very long and hard to think about what we're trying to achieve with this. And I, I don't think in your presentation of the draft it really hits too much what we're trying to achieve. And so I wanna go back to one example you pointed out that other SDOs are doing this. Um, I think that's very reflective to learn from that. And let's take the W3C case here. Um, you know, I, I think about our draft, the internet is for end users. It seems to have be something we have consensus on. Um, and we have this idea of diversity that we're trying to do and bring a multi-stakeholder model into these types of things. Now, what happened to the W3C is their draft was forked by what working group. And fundamentally, if there's a conflict in what working group, ultimately, the people that decide is only the steering group. And, you know, the steering group is Apple, Mozilla, Google, Microsoft. If that's your idea of a multi-stakeholder model, then we, you know, we've lost it somewhere along the ways here. Um, so when you think about what groups are going to be capable of forking something and doing it, and what would be their motivations for doing that, I think you have to think about that pretty long and hard to decide whether it's the right thing to do. Now, that said, in open source, I'm actually a fan of, yeah, actually it's right to enable that, and the way you compete against that is by doing the best work. So I'm not saying that I'm dead set against this, but I'm saying the real issues you'd have to think about if you were going to decide whether this is a good idea or not have not been discussed in this room yet today. Now, that might be an argument to form a working group to discuss them, but forming the working group sort of seems like presupposing that we want to get there. Um, you're looking at quizmally. Okay, I'll, I, it, it wouldn't have to be. It usually is. Um, but I, I do think that, I, I think this is a decision that we'd have to talk a lot more about. What, when is this useful? Why is it useful? What are we trying to accomplish? And do we agree with that? And does that align with our stuff? I also think the trustees, um, when they say that they only consider um, the advice they get from IETF, I, I wish that was true for you, but unfortunately it won't be fully true for you. I think that as trustees, you will, you, you have other things you have to keep in mind, and I, I suspect you'll have to think about the intent of why that IPR was given to the trust in the first place, um, and what was the intent of that. Uh, and that might influence your decisions a little bit, as well as what the, the ITF wants to do with it. Uh, it would certainly be a lot easier to do this for documents going forward, where they'd clearly identified in this sort of sense to start with. Than, just than on that past. point, right. just yeah. on that point, Colin, uh, RC fifty three seventy eight has a has a clause in it that specifically says that the trust may may consider more open licensing. Yeah, and the little thing that forgets to mention in that is they didn't actually get everybody that they needed to sign on to that, and it's probably highly legally challengeable. So 
there are some fine print in there that you get into some sort of messy stuff, right? I wasn't, um, there. I wasn't there for that, so I couldn't comment on that. That's just pure speculation. As far yeah, as I'm yeah. Concerned. no, no. I mean, look, like, look, we it, they were granted the ability to make broad decisions on that, yeah. but I think that on the other hand, they would have to consider not only. I mean, I think most trustees have a a, a, a variety of things they have to think about in uh, of doing course. something. Yes, yes. 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 So, um, but my main point really is just like, ah. Uh, you know, can you say more about like a, a use case where you imagine this would just be a, a good thing for the internet? Because that's that's how I'm going to evaluate it. Is this good for the internet? Okay. Thanks. So, yeah. Um, just briefly, um, every couple of years we publish the 10,000 page document that is, um, is it NFS? Does the ITF want to continue doing that? Is this the right place to do that work? I don't know. Um, and maybe that group of people um, who don't have a huge overlap with the rest of the work in this in this area might decide to go elsewhere. I don't know. Uh, you can think of many examples like that potentially um, around the edges of the ITF where um, work has come here from essentially outside. And um, uh, I was chair of the GeoJSON working group, for instance, a very small group of people uh, who, who worked on something and they might they might find that they have now working in the Open, open Geo, Geospatial Consortium on, on that work and they want to continue that work over there. Instead, uh, I, I would say that, uh, yes, they could secure permission, but it might be it might be nicer if it were just permissionless. Harold. Hi, Raval, this is John. I was greatly sympathetic to your presentation. There was only one point I thought was wrong which was the words, this has not been ex extensively discussed. As former chair of the IPR working group, approximately two, two, 2006, I can guarantee you that this has been extensively discussed and every single argument that has, that has been put forward so far in this room has, was, already, was also put forward in 2006. Now, personally, I think that uh, the consensus of the group then that I was chairing was wrong. I think the independent submissions editor, which has a more a liberal copyright statement, got it right there. Uh, but I think that we need to consider carefully what we do here. So. This cannot possibly be an AD-sponsored thing or anything that is going to consume fewer cycles than IPR of 2006 did. Unfortunately, that might lead you to abandon the idea and run away in horror, but uh, I guess if we want to change it, we have to do it. Hi, I'm Richard Barnes. I'm a derivative works enthusiast. I enqueued mainly to demonstrate the absurdity of the current policy. Y'all are all focused on protocol maintenance, but derivative works are not just other people like develop, doing nice work and you know republishing TLS with enterprise backdoors. I, in fact, created a derivative works machine. Um, Y'all can go to rfcs.online and take your favorite uh, RFC number and get a fresh copy served from GitHub's cache so it's a lot faster than the official repository uh, with some nice style improvements as well. Those are all derivative works. Um, so yeah, I am in violation of the policy. Um, so this, like, I think it illustrates how the current policy is both way overzealous and ineffective because I really, you know, you know Glenn, you're, you're a, a uh, the trustees, I'm sure, are doing their job protecting the IPR, but I doubt they're going to waste the resources to come prevent me from, uh, come sue me for making these derivative works. Um, and like, I don't think that would be a wise use of their uh, resources as trustees. So I think there's some change needed here to make this less of a ridiculous situation. I think Martin's draft is in the right direction. Um, and we should head that way. I, I think this, this focus on documents is, is actually kind of missing the point. The value of the IETF is not the documents. As, as Martin pointed out, like people can make documents. People make documents all the time. They, they you know, writing a, a variant of TLS that, that does the bad things, not hard. The value the IETF adds is the consensus and uh, bringing the right folks to the process. So like, let's not be precious about our documents and open things up. 
John Peterson, yeah, just to Richard's point, I mean, I think, you know, there, there are a lot of uncopyrightable ideas that anyone can instantiate in any way they see fit. The point of the trust is to own a set of documents and documents have copyrights. The uncopyrightable ideas that are in them can be done over in 16 different ways. Same with the trademarks as, as uh, Glenn mentioned earlier. So, I mean, I, I think there is something worth poking at here. I, I think maybe like a non-working group forming BOF where we surface what has been discussed about this in the past and like kind of see if we can figure out what a scope might be for this is. But to be perfectly frank, I mean, I suspect that anybody out in the world probably has the power given how lenient we are about citations at great length is my understanding in the trust from these documents. I believe it says at any length, is that correct, Glenn? Are you nodding? I'm not talking about reproducing in whole. I'm talking, I, I, right, but right. you can cite it. And like, you can cite it freely without restriction. Without restrictions. So, I mean, you can take more or less as much of this copyrighted text as you want and combine it with some other text that you wrote, right? Like. <laughs> no, that's why, that's why I started off with the, the, the clarification. You, you, so you can cite it like a URL citation, point, point a URL at it or say, go look in this document in this place. Not really. You cannot take snippets under our current license terms and stick, stick them into other bits. Oh, so like 3GPP and everybody else who has done that since time so, so, we, so, so in some cases, there have been sp special licenses done upon request, but in general, the rule is you can take uh, an RFC, reproduce it in whole, uh -huh. but if you want to take little bits, that one we don't give general licenses to. Other than fair use and... and, and and then the other thing we do, obviously for fair use, that, that's a consideration, yes. Yeah. And then the other place we often will do uh, is that if somebody comes along and says, hey, I want to work on John's document, we say, great, we share a copyright with John, go talk to John and get up, get an yeah, agreement yeah, from John yeah. to go do it, and then go do it. Yeah, the joint work mentioned this and, is and, also and, another and while wrinkle that, that like, need to be. Let me clarify one thing. <laughs> it may seem like a cop that we do that, but the focus of the trust is the, enabling the work of the ITF, not the work of other parties, which is why we say, if you want, if you want to enable somebody else, go do that. Our focus is entirely the ITF. Okay. And, but again, I think my, my point, my fundamental point is here, your ability to create derivative works effectively that rely on the uncopyrightable ideas seems to be unlimited. And like, so it's, I, I'm not really sure there is that much of a problem to solve here, but I would be more than happy to go to a non-working group off to discuss it. David Skenazi, apocalypse enthusiast. So let's talk about the doomsday scenario. Like just hypothetical here. So let's say I'm a quick enthusiast. I want to build the next version of quick. And I don't know, Lars told me my dog was ugly. So I've decided I don't want to do this work in the IETF. Um, you know, that might be a bad reason to not want to come to the IETF. It could be a good reason, but in this hypothetical, I don't want to do this work in the IETF. So what would happen today with the current rules? I'll just spend a little bit more time and write a bunch more text and I'll make a version of quick that's actually just shittier because I'm less good at writing than the folks who have written the one that's there. Um, if we do what Martin is proposing, of course, a lot of details need to be handled, but let's say we open it up, then what, what I'll do is use start from a good word, starting point, which is the quick RFC, and then make the edits that I need. And then I'll deploy that to the internet. The document that'll be available will be better for everyone. That's kind of why I see this proposal has value. If we think that, oh, the trust in this, I, this copyright is what's preventing David from doing his stupid other version of quick, you're deluded. I'll do it anyway. I'll just do a poor job. Hi. Uh, I do not, in fact, think that David's dog is ugly. Um, so having fought this fight, um, David's scenario is not the doomsday scenario. The doomsday scenario is when the work is taken, modified uh, by an organization that uh, regulators pay attention to, and then the regulators say, do this version instead. Worse is when some regulators say, do this version, another standards body picks it up and says, do this version, and now you have three versions. 
You'd think that might not happen, only we see standards organizations and regulators pressing in that direction right now in various different dimensions. Martin, you wrote a letter um, along the lines of, uh, uh, along these lines to oppose regulators involving themselves in, in, in a particular standard or going against a particular standard already. Now, obviously they're not using your words, they're not copying your words, but we've seen that copying before. And the copying happens in organizations where they have, um, let's just say, they're in treaty language, right? So it, this is a problem that has to be gone through, I think, a little bit more judiciously. And, as, and I think we have a tendency in this organization to jump from zero to infinity without going in between. So I'm not saying let's not do something here. I'm saying let's please do something at a, in, in an incremental fashion um, where perhaps the, the trust is a little bit more involved, the ISG is a little bit more involved, and we see what sort of requests come through. It's not entirely permission, permissionless as you're suggesting, but it, it's a middle ground. I understand that that has some limitations, like you know, people can't just go and do what they want. Um, the other point I just wanna make is that uh, somebody said that the ICE has a very liberal policy. Uh, speaking with my ICE hat on, yeah, he does. Unfortunately, we, don't actually, we haven't actually implemented that, and it's something that uh, I'm currently causing uh, both Joel and uh, Glenn a great deal of headache on so that we can make it more liberal. I'd like to get to the point where we, even got, where we could even do stuff like create derivative works of ICE documents in the RFC series, which we currently can't do unless, unless one of the authors agrees. So things are bad on my side. We're going to work on that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, we get the feeling that there is support uh, at different levels, uh, but that there is mo uh, more work is needed. Uh, we'll take this uh, to the list as well. Great. Please be mindful that this is the last uh, presentation and that we have uh, a bit less than an hour, uh, a bit less than half an hour. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Shouldn't take that long. I know, the... but I'm talking to the people yeah, no, that I, will come to I, the I, mic. I <laughs> if they come to the mic, I'll stage dive. Um, is the cue? Okay. Um, next slide. Uh, so I was an OMCOM chair last year. I, therefore, that means I also get to sit in uh, mostly silently for this year. Uh, these are some experiences. This proposal came from a hallway discussion Jeff Houston and I had uh, last IETF. He was too shy and retiring to come up here and talk about it. It's... Yeah, okay, those are laughing, no Jeff. Okay, so the NOMCOM has two major jobs. Um, the first part of it is to figure out its business, how it's supposed to operate. There's this little bootstrap section in RFC 8713, one of the few numbers I know, uh, that talks about how you do the first vote, and one of those things you do is set up the rules for the whole rest of the committee. Uh, then you have to perform the selection process. Uh, last year, because of illness and so on, we were constrained for the first half. Um, we started late, we didn't have enough time, uh, we had many people scattered around the world, uh, many people who did not speak English as their primary or initial language. So it was hard to set up the mechanics. It was therefore hard to get the selection process started. Uh, we were squeezed for time. The first uh, third bullet, the first test can take some time. Uh, the only assured source of advice you have is that the prior NOMCOM chair is supposed to be there to help you, and Gabe certainly was for me. Um, and there's this little in quiet internal fraternity uh, of previous NOMCOM chairs who you can always feel free to call on. Um, I had promised Andrew when, I, uh, when he chose me, if, when, I interviewed, when he interviewed me for being, uh, to decide if, who he wanted to pick, that I would uh, you know, make this a lot more visible. Uh, you may have seen, recall some of the experiments I had about public statements and things like that that were not well received by the community. Uh, but 
the intent is to sort of make it less of a puff of smoke at the end of the process i do have a diary that i intend to publish through the i s e but i want to wait to see how the second half works so the question is how can we improve this so that non comms start more quickly next slide so the proposal is a two year non com appointment staggered terms we take 10 voting volunteers we have you know typical bootstrap phase where you know we divide you know the non com chair makes two selections of five then we you know after that year every five every year we pick five new people next slide the chair has a three year staggered term it's currently two you're the incoming chair you get to watch you get to learn you get to see what mistakes they made you're the chair who does all the work and is responsible for all it gets the nice plaque at the March ITF I tried to cut up the plaque and offer it to all of all of the volunteers but it's now engraved metal as opposed to just lucite so we couldn't do that and then the following year you are the the past chair to advise you know someone who has already seen it one time around so presumably the past chair role becomes less important or less useful this follows the standard medical practice of see one do one teach one next slide please the strengths advantages of this is it gives a greater level of continuity you have certainly you know the socialization if we have whenever we have the next global pandemic it's going to be harder to establish working relationships among the very important members of an on-com so we hopefully allows you know faster startup hopefully people would be aware and there wouldn't be the two clicks you know the newcomers and the upperclassmen the idea of hazing them sounds kind of interesting but it allows each member also to gather experience understanding and know how things currently are with the bodies that are pointing to a more frank blunt rude way of saying this is you get another shot to fix the mistakes you made last year right it also allows members to take you know you you can have greater confidence you're not just gonna make one thing and then the whole IETF has to deal with what you picked over the course of six months for the next two years or year next slide please weaknesses it certainly requires a greater time commitment it may reduce the volunteer pool we don't know it's we have I've discussed with Jay and Robert we could for example poll all of the previous non-com volunteers those who volunteered and said hey if it were a two-year term would you still sign up so we could find out there is certainly the greater potential of influence and you know stuffing the ballot box because everyone now has two chances to get involved and make appointments I think it would make the non-com elegy consideration security considerations nine nine seven nine seven whatever the RFC is it would complicate some of that so it has certainly have to discuss that and think about that a bit there's a phrase in the you know from Benjamin Franklin that maybe but you know well the general concept is the fewer people know something the more likely you can keep it secret often phrased as three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead if you have people who are on non-com for two or in the case of chair three years it's certainly going to be a greater burden of confidentiality on those people but people tend to be pretty diligent about being on non-com and you know that there's also I think a risk of ossification for things like the interview questions oh well let you know for my non-com we opened up the wiki and so everybody could see for example what the interview questions were what the scheduling was like and so on and now there would be a greater temp interest I think from you know the repeat members of the voting volunteers to say oh well you know these questions worked really well last year let's just use those newcomers will say well gee I don't know I don't have any experience in that so I think there's also a risk of us as I said ossification standardization might be a possible way of putting on it but the advantage for example of interview questions is people don't know what the questions are ahead of time so you're asking them to think on their feet 
Um, and certainly being able to think on your feet and talk reasonably uh, is a good skill to have at the IETF. Next. Uh, there's a bunch of questions. Um, you know, should members be unable to volunteer if they, uh, you know, I've said, if you say, um, yes, I'll do a two year term after one year, can you say, no, I'm not doing it anymore? I mean, goodness grief, that never happens around here. <laughs> uh, appointments, you know, when we have to pick someone who has resigned, where do we pick them from and so on. So there's lots of little nitty gritty details. It's the basic concept that I want to see if there is interested in and what we should do. Next slide, please. Is that it? Okay. I'm done. Elliot, you're first. He's, yeah, the top three are from the previous queue. Elliot's from the previous. Oh, yes? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Missed that one. Okay. Mallory. Hi, Mallory Nodal, Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, I, my general point is that this is in tension with the value of randomness from a high level, but in practice, what I mean is that, um, say for example, this current NOMCOM, which you're all doing a heroic effort, but there are no women on it. So now we have to wait a whole nother year before we get another NOMCOM that might actually have a woman on it. And I get why that's statistically tricky, yeah? But it, but it highlights how you might have some negative effects from the stagnation where the randomness is there. And we think a lot about randomness. I remember Donald Eastlake's presentation in the last meeting, um, that randomness is there because you need fresh and you need new and you need to some degree more impartiality. And I also worry, and this is my second point on this, that having someone in the role for two rounds of hiring people to these positions reduces their impartiality just ever so slightly. Because there are people who are up for leadership positions year over year. And so one person that might be there two times in a row, they have less of an impartial committee the second time, if that is making any sense. I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. I just wanted to introduce some of the things you haven't yet covered in like your potential downsides. And, and the, more, the more important one from my perspective is this diversity, this sure. diversity question, which maybe has a totally separate response and doesn't have anything to do with your draft, but we can take up elsewhere in other discussions. Thanks. Uh, sure, no, I think uh, another way to, that I would look at the, your first point, which I think is completely valid and we completely missed, is we are going from picking 10 people at random to five people at random. So yeah, I get that. And as to the second point, yeah, no, nothing to add. I don't allow this job. Uh, whenever we design protocols, it's always wise to consider uh, what happens if they're attacked. One of the reasons behind the weird nature of the NOMCOM system is resistance against attack. As in, you can pack the volunteer pool. You can attempt to get as many people from your own company or allied companies uh, into, the, into, the, into the NOMCOM as you can. The randomness guarantees that you are not guaranteed of success. Furthermore, even if you succeed for one year, the fact that the NOMCOM goes away and a new random NOMCOM gets picked the next year means that you only get to kick out half the current badasses in, in, in leadership positions, then uh, and the next NOMCOM may undo your careful work in order to take over the organization. So making two-year positions weakens those protections. A single bad selection can now be in a position to replace the entire IETF leadership. And under our current rules, there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. That is perhaps unrealistic in most years under most conditions. But when you're thinking about this adversarially, 
rather than peacefully if they come so worry sure i i understand the concern about that we're not planning on changing any of the limitations so that if I, you know so for example what i'm saying is that the current changes you have proposed change those limitations i'm not convinced that they are and they they need analysis absolutely but for example the limit on no two people from akamai that would carry now over for two years not just one year right or no li the limit right right now if you had two people from akamai on year one you could have two more people on Ak two different people from akamai on year two now it would be you could have two people from akamai and Again, anyhow, I think it requires some analysis, but I understand your point. Yes. Uh, Leslie Daigle, not as tall as Harold. Um, a couple of other things I think worth considering right now, the commitment of non-com members is pretty intense. So anybody who has got a non-com member in a, a role in their working group knows that they're not paying a whole lot of, of attention this week, or at least not as much as they might. So this proposal runs the risk of taking those people out of their actual workflows for a couple of years. Um, that said, I think um, also possibly a solvable problem with a slightly different tweaking of things. So the thing that I mostly wanted to say standing up here is um, thank you for presenting this as a problem uh, with some pros and cons of a straw proposal. Um, because I think it, it's a worthwhile discussion. You've identified you are in a position to assert with authority that there are challenges with the current system. I think it would be worth having a boff to go through this in more detail and understand you know, what, what changes might be made in order to address the known problems. Um, maybe it's the straw proposal you have. Maybe there are other ways to handle it, but we're a pretty smart crowd when presented with a problem space that actually articulates pros, cons, and possible directions, I think we could have a useful discussion. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, Ted Hardy, occasional modalist. I will say that I give an answer to the dispatch question that I think this particular draft should be dispatched with no action. I don't think the draft is ready for uh, consideration by the broader ITF at this point in either a BOF or a working group, because I think it's not actually convincing that it's optimizing for the right thing. And I think Harold set out uh, a, con a set of concerns um, that indicate why you might uh, optimize for something in security or uh, resistance against particular forms of attack that's pretty compelling to say the current design had a set of things it was optimizing for and changing what it's optimizing for in order to achieve this goal. Uh, I don't think the draft is convincing on this point at this at this moment. Thank you. I think it's not even not convincing. It's pretty silent on the fact is whether or not it affects the security considerations of the current system. I, I took myself out of the queue early there. Sorry, I'm sitting behind Ted. <laughs> uh, this is John Peterson again. Um, but I'm really just going to say up the plus, plus one to Ted. Yeah, I think no action. I'm Tarot Taraki, a sovereign type one. Sorry, is it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> David Skenazi. Um, just a quick show of hands. Like, who in the room has, has explained the NomCom process to someone who didn't know it before? How wide did their eyes get? <laughs> like, our process is insanely complicated. There might be good reasons for it. I'm sure there are good reasons for that. There might be some few things that can be improved, but adding a bunch more complication like this is sounds quite worrisome to me. This is already a very delicate equilibrium and more complex systems fail more often is something we've learned in engineering. I'm Tarot Turkey, a sovereign tech one. Um, I do agree that it is already a complex system and the, perhaps the proposed solution is a bit more complex. Um, I'd like to like just point out to the first sentence that says that the non-com process is actually two processes, and I feel like that's where the crux of the problem is. Um, and I was wondering like, if maybe like a better way of going around it is to actually simplify the system by breaking out the mode of operation bits of it to 
make that a more permanent, contiguous uh, uh, working group or a similar secretariat sort of type position that will be non-voting and then have the voting members rotate that and their only job would be just to interview and they, and vote and not be involved in uh, any sort of decisions about the operations. Um, yeah, that would be my, my suggestion. Thank you. Hi, Peter Koch. Um, what I'm going to say is not intended to kill the, uh, kill the discussion, but somebody has to say it. Um, some of this is, is actually how the ICANN NOMCOM is set up. It, it's very similar, the staggered um, works of the, of the chairs and essentially the staggered membership of the um, appointees in that case and the random, um, random people here. Um, so there is um, prior art, so to speak, um, and maybe um, I'm not sure whether you had the chance to, to talk to people there. I have been on the ICANN NOMCOM as the IATF appointee excuse me, for two consecutive terms. So I've worked under that in a different um, forum, of course. Um, I'm not completely sure I understand the problem description, um, but I have the feeling that you propose two solutions which might be uh, worth looking at um, separately. The one is the experience of the chair. That staggered model obviously has some, some attractiveness except for the long-term commitment for, for anybody wanting to, um, uh, to apply. Um, on the level of detail, the past chair can be the past past chair or anybody, and then you, you can fill around with that. Um, a risk that you, um, I'm not sure have identified, but that I want to mention is that if you have this continuity on the, non -com mem the voting NOMCOM members, and you have the bootstrapping progress, a process, I'm sorry, where you um, actually set your own rules. Um, then you might want to think whether continuity is actually a good idea at that stage, or you want fresh blood, even though our process doesn't guarantee that you get fresh people every time, but immediate returns may be, may be more, um, more rare. And there's one other observation. Um, when I mentioned ICANN, their major positions have three-year terms and you have these staggered chairs with your model in two-year terms, the past chair would actually review their own assignments from, from the previous, previous NOMCOM and that might or might not be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Sparks, I thought Peter came very close to, to stealing what I was coming to say, but he didn't quite get there. Um, one of the features that the current system has that the proposed change loses is a complete shock replacement. The, 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 the thing you're identifying is a problem that the um, nomcoms come in with n n having to bootstrap from zero is perhaps not, is perhaps more of a feature than a problem. When you move from a model where you don't have that shock to the system to a model where you've got overlapping continuity, you now have a new system that develops a culture and the culture will self-propagate. You know, this is a feature that we have in the ISGs with the rollover that we have right now. The ISG teaches the next ISG from the continuing members how things have you know, gone and we end up with an ISG that has a much more muted state in its actual behavior that we might not want out of a nomcom. We want it, we might want a nomcom to come in and be able to do something and think radically different from the last one and not ask what was going on with what last nomcom's thinking. Much less important observation, if we went forward with something like this, I would caution, I, I would urge a lot of caution in thinking about the periodicity of replacements um, and not necessarily lining them up so much with the periodicity for the bodies that you're appointing for, lest you set up a weird resonance. Those are both really interesting and excellent points. Thank you, Robert. Tilish? 
Thank you. Thanks, Rich. I read the draft interesting proposal, and there's like two like different things that came to my mind. First one is I don't like the two-year term thing, right? Like because it kind of narrows down the volunteer pool more because you're going to have an even more restricted set of people who are willing to come in time for two years. So it's actually going to make it like probably less diverse, like less all the things we want, right? I think that's the biggest concern I have, right? And I don't see the necessarily the uh, startup speed increasing because of that. So that's like one part of it. The part I really liked is the the chair side, which is very interesting to like kind of do the the incoming chair shadow. I li really like that idea. There might be some logistical difficulties with it because if uh, can somebody know f a year from now whether they'll be available for a year after, right? I think that's something you can explore. But I do like the idea that the uh, incoming chair shadows the previous chair before. Thanks. Samuel and Jeff. May I? Yeah, please. Sam Weiler. I've served on two non-coms as a voting member. We've had non-coms with varying degrees of cultural experience. Um, we've had ones where many people had been on non-coms before. We've had ones where fewer had. But we, we give those non-coms a chance to appoint advisors. So a non-com that wanted more continuity could appoint past chairs or past voting members as advisors at their discretion. Right? Now, we had a case three years ago where a chair wanted to appoint some advisors that I believe her non-com declined to accept. But I'm still comfortable leaving that discretion with the non-com and not forcing extra continuity on them. I don't think we need to take this anywhere. I'm content with the status quo. Jeff Houston, with your permission. Yeah. yeah. Look, part of this, because I was part of NOMCOM last year, which is why I'm a co-author here, is that getting 10 people and a chair in a new job that they've got no feel to put some, like, you know, bunnies in the headlight. <laughs> they really spend a lot of time struggling with what they have to do. And by the end of this process, when you're meant to actually complete the appointments, it's rushed. It's extremely rushed. I wouldn't, wouldn't say ill-considered, but it's certainly considered with a very tight time frame. That does not necessarily lead to outcomes that are in the best interests of this organisation. And so it's trying to understand how you can provide a framework that allows this process to actually get a little better at the job it's trying to do. And that's this element of continuity. This approach is one of the best ways that I felt in talking to Rick about how do you get both the chair and some of the members to lend some of that experience going forward so that not everything is a complete surprise to everybody. Now, there's still 10 people selected at random. It's just the selection occurs over two years rather than one. So I don't buy the it's no longer as random as it used to be. It is still random. But the, the other issue is when you have an accelerated process where everyone is feeling their way through, the outcomes do not reflect a considered view of the needs of the organisation and community, it reflects the timetable. And that's not necessarily in anyone's interests. And I don't think last year was an anomaly. I was the chair eons ago of this same process and ran under exactly the same constraints. So I may not have enumerated the problem statement well, Leslie, and I'm sorry. And it was a leap to this thing provides better continuity, but it's certainly an honest effort to try and understand how we can improve. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, totally agree. And I, if I didn't say it as well as it could have been, it wouldn't have been the first time I did that in a gen dispatch meeting. Well, seems like uh, more work is needed or more clarity. Uh, I'll, I'll foreshadow what the likely outcome is, but if anyone is interested in talking about it or is trying to set up a BAF or a side meeting at Brisbane or the one following, please get in touch with me. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, that closes the Gen Dispatch session in Prague, IETF 118. See you in Brisbane. Thank you.